name's Dave Norton from Discovering New England History. We're going to uh, continue on with our story of John and Elizabeth Howland, who are uh, pilgrims, the great pilgrim story in uh, Massachusetts, certainly, and also in America. So we'll go to our first slide here. Next slide. Now, John Howland, as we left the last episode, he, he died in uh, 1672 when he was 80 years old and he's buried there on Burial Hill in uh, Plymouth. And that's a picture of it. And there, on the right there, there's a picture of his actual um, uh, marker, grave marker. And so now Elizabeth is all by herself. We'll go to the next slide. Now, they, uh, of course, had their home in um, Rocky, uh, Rock, what they call Rocky Nook, uh, which is about four miles north of Plymouth. And they were there for quite a few years, 37 years. And Elizabeth Howland now is 66 years old. And John and Elizabeth had 11, uh, 10 children. And only two by now were uh, living with Elizabeth, Isaac Howland and Joseph Howland. And, and Isaac was 23 and Joseph was 35. And so now they're basically on their own because John has passed away. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, King Philip's War. That begins in 1675. And Elizabeth is, uh, I think, the only uh, pilgrim that actually uh, lived through the uh, King Philip's War. And it actually came to where their, where their house was. And she was living there with uh, Elizabeth. She was there with Joseph and I Isaac. And they both escaped the house before the Wampanoags under the King Philip came through the town and started burning homes. And they, their house, which they lived in for many years, was set on fire and burned right to the ground. So everything she happened, uh, <laughs> there's another thing. I mean... You can imagine her, she survived England, she survived Holland, she survived the uh, terrible uh, trip all the way across the uh, Atlantic Ocean and uh, the first winter where she lost her mother and her father and her aunt and her uncle, they all died in the first winter. And now here we are, she lost her husband and now the house that they lived in and that they really liked was burnt right to the ground. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, they moved back into Plymouth. One of her other sons, Jabez Howland, had his house here in Plymouth. And so they had, needed a place to stay. So Elizabeth, Joseph, and Isaac all moved in because their home was completely destroyed. King Philip's War, 1675. We'll go to the next slide. And I took this great shot here inside the house. Uh, it's... Uh, it's an incredible piece of history here in Plymouth. Uh, the house is still standing, and uh, you can go and visit it, which I did. And they let me, fortunately, let me take a few pictures here. There's their main fireplace and their living room area. And we'll go to the next slide. And there's another fireplace, which is um, also in the house. And so the family now, the Howlands, are now living in... Uh, in Plymouth. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, Isaac Howland, he was uh, 26 years old, and he wanted to, uh, you know, protect his family, protect his homestead, and whatever. So he joined the uh, Plymouth Colony Militia. And there's a picture there. They're drilling in uh, Plymouth. And that's sort of a uh, picture on the uh, left there of what uh, Isaac probably would have looked like. And he was quite a marksman. We'll go to the next slide. Now, leading up to this, we're going to tell a story of John Thompson. And uh, he had a house in Halifax. And once again, the, um, the Wampanoags and King Philip uh, attacked and they completely burned down his house, and he, uh, he escaped. And uh, there's a marker right on the road, and there's a picture of it right there. And that's actually 
the hearthstone of his house. They took it, took it <laughs> and they tipped it up and then they put a uh, plaque on it. So it's quite a memorial to uh, John Thompson. And if you go to the next slide, we can, uh, we can see a close up there. This hearthstone uh, marks the site of the home of Lieutenant John Thompson, first settler in Halifax. The house was burned 1675. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, when they were starting uh, burning all the homes in uh, the area, the families vacated and they went down to Middleborough, Massachusetts. And Thompson was, he was the head of the garrison and that's a garrison house there over on the, uh, on the left. Of course, it's no longer there. And all the families gathered in that house because it was fortified for protection and the Wampanoags went through and burnt all, all the houses and destroyed everything in the town, but they were still there. And on your right is the, um, the Masket River. And I'll show you how this all plays an important part of, this, of the story. Everyone was uh, gathered in the house and they fully expected a complete attack. We'll go to the next slide. Now, what, uh, what Thompson did is he said, I, I need the best marksman that we have here. And of course, that was Isaac Howland, and he volunteered for that. And the actual garrison house at the time, when I checked with the uh, Middleborough Historical Society, was right on the uh, middle school baseball field, which is right there. And from the baseball field, you can see the picture of the house way in the distance, and in between the house and the baseball field is the Namaska River. Now, what happened here was all the, uh, the Wampanoag warriors were gathered around where that house was. And they were just making all kinds of noise and, and, and just, you know, ready to, uh, to make an attack. So Thompson, uh, he told Isaac, he said, I want you to take... Uh, my long gun is what they called it. And I want you to uh, just fire one shot. There's a Wampanoag that's standing on this rock over there. You know, and it's a long distance away, by the way. <laughs> and he loaded up with the uh, gunpowder and everything else. And we'll go to the next slide. And he just wanted to fire one shot. Well, what he did was, there's the, actually a rock right there. Wampanoag was standing on a rock. Now, the distance he fired from the garrison house, historians measured it to that rock, is a half a mile or the length of nine football fields, which is amazing <laughs> for a smooth bore musket. Now, a rifle, of course, the bullet can, can twist and it can much more better accuracy. A musket ball, you never know where that's going to go, especially half a mile. And basically, um, your rifle is probably only good for maybe five football fields. This was nine football fields away. So Isaac took one shot. And the one shot went, uh, certainly by luck, just supposed to scare him. He hit him and killed and knocked the uh, Wampanoag off the rock. Now, I wanted to find out. I knew there was a hand rock in history, and I wanted to find out where it was. So I went to the historical, Middleborough Historical Society, and they told me it was on private land. But since I was uh, interested in all of this, they knew the owner, and maybe I would like to go over there and uh, take some pictures. And I said, yes, I would. <laughs> And so if you go back to that picture there, there's, that's where I am, there's the rock. And to commemorate the loss of that Wampanoag warrior, they chiseled in his right hand print on the rock. And you can see it, I've got the red uh, circle around it if you can look very carefully. And that's a uh, memorial to the uh, Wampanoag warrior. And uh, no one, it's on private property, so no one else can actually see that. So I was very fortunate to have that uh, pictures taken. We'll go to the next slide. Now, on the left, many years later, uh, they still had the rifle. They called the Thompson gun. And on the lower uh, right corner, that's picture taken way back in the day, and that's the actual, uh, actual rock up on the hill next to that house. And you can see the rifle seven feet, uh, six inches long. Weigh 25 pounds. We'll go to the next slide. 
And there it is. It's on permanent uh, display at the Old Colony Museum in Taunton, Massachusetts. And that's amazing. That's, that's uh, amazing. I guess the family uh, handed it over to them and they uh, made it on permanent uh, display in Taunton. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, I found his grave, Isaac Howland. Uh, it's in Middleborough. There's this gravestone on the right. It's in a cemetery across the road from a, uh, from a church. So that's where he's actually buried. That's quite a story. That's, I believe that's the longest um, smoothbore musket shot ever, ever taken. Well, the next slide. Now, Elizabeth Howland, <laughs> at, at some point in time, she was going to move out of the house and get another house, and she decided to move in with her daughter, Lydia Brown, and they lived in Riverside, Rhode Island. So at this point, uh, she was 74 years old, and she moved in with uh, Lydia Brown. And that's, the house is long gone, but that's an idea of what a, a typical uh, farmhouse would look look like. So she moved in there in Riverside, Rhode Island, and at that time in history, that was part of uh, what's called Swansea, Massachusetts. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, the homestead. We talked about the house that was burnt down. Uh, I found that, and that's uh, Rocky Nook, which is now Kingston, Massachusetts. And uh, the Howlands lived there from 1638 to 1675. And there's a nice marker there, and uh, you can go and visit, visit that. So we'll go to the next slide. And when I was there, they were doing an archaeological dig, which was amazing. It was in the summertime. And these folks are all from the, uh, I believe it's the University of Virginia, and they, every summer in August they come down and they dig a little more, trying to find any artifacts. It's an important part of history, and certainly for all the Howland descendants. We'll go to the next slide. And I took these pictures. That's the Howland's front doorway. <clears throat> and uh, they had it all laid out, basically, where the, uh, where the house was. It's up on a, up on a hill. It's, uh, back then, that was way out in west. <laughs> Because <laughs> uh, the main settlement, of course, was Plymouth, and this was uh, way f away from the main settlement. And we'll go to the next slide. And the hearth, once again, we talked about it was a stone ender house, so which means one of the walls or the fireplace was all, all rock. It was all uh, part of the fireplace, and that's the. John Howland Fireplace Hearth. And if you go there, you can actually see that, and you actually stand right there. It's quite, uh, quite a discovery. And every August, they keep on digging for different artifacts. It's quite, uh, quite a place to go. We'll go to the next slide. Now, there's another story here. Uh, William Bradford, of course, I'm a direct descendant of William Bradford, and the Mayflower Compact. Now, the original Mayflower Compact, of course, was uh, signed by all the pilgrims in Plymouth when they were on the Mayflower so they could all get together and form a new government. Uh, <clears throat> and William Bradford, he wrote a, uh, wrote a book at, uh, right after um, the Plymouth settlement, a manuscript. So go to the next slide. And the next slide, next slide, we describe what happened to that. This is quite a story, too. Um, <clears throat> this manuscript, the original Mayflower Compact was lost to history. Nobody knows the story in that. However, uh, the book uh, is called Of Plymouth Plantation, written by, um, actually right here on my desk right here, William Bradford's manuscript. He wrote around 1630, 1640, in that, in that period of time, that manuscript. And um, actually, it, it, was, it was found <laughs> by, during the Revolutionary War. So we'll go to the next, next slide. And it ended up in the uh, meeting house in Boston. And that was a picture of the meeting house on our uh, next slide. And there you go. 
It was, it was landed in the meeting house in Boston. And from this meeting house, it was way up on the top, they said, and it was hidden for many years. Not really hidden, no one really knew what it was. <laughs> um, but the significance of this is William Bradford made a duplicate copy of the Mayflower Compact and everyone signed it. And it's in this book. Now along comes the uh, 1775 American uh, Revolution. And uh, the, uh, <laughs> the British stole the book and sent it over to England as a war trophy. So we'll go to the next slide. And it ended up in the Ful Fulham Palace in London, home of the Bishop of London. <laughs> and there's a, quite a story here. <clears throat> they wanted to keep it as a war trophy, and uh, it was back and forth, back and forth. Of course, America wanted it back. It's, and uh, basically, late in the 1800s is when they finally gave it, gave it back to Boston. So we'll go to the next slide. And now it's in the Boston Public Library, locked up in a vault. There's a, quite a piece of uh, American history. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, William Bradford, he's also buried in Burial Hill. And uh, when I was there, I took that picture that's, his, uh, that's a marker here on his grave site. So we certainly owe him and part of history as for um, actually uh, saving a copy of the uh, May Mayflower Compact. Now we'll go to the next slide. And we have another story here to, uh, to get into. The um, Christopher Jones, of course, was the ship's captain of the Mayflower. And remember, he uh, came all the way to Plymouth, but he had to stay there through the winter because everyone was sick, and then he went back to uh, England. Well, anyway, there's some research. That's his picture, portrait. And that's his house where he lived in Harwich, England. And he died in 1622, so two years after he, uh, he landed in uh, Plymouth. Made it back to England, and he died shortly thereafter. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, what happened with, to the Mayflower? Well, the fate of the Mayflower. <laughs> in 1624, it, you know, it came back to England, but it was really in bad shape making all those journeys. And what they did back in the day is they... Um, would sell, they would sell the ships to the local farmers and they would take it all apart, use the lumber to build barns or houses or whatever they, they wanted to do. So it was actually the record, it was all, it's all documented, it was sold for scrap lumber in 1624. And there's a great portrait of it. It shows some of the local farmers there taking it all apart piece by piece. And this is quite a story. We'll go to the next slide. Believe it or not, it was assembled in a barn in Buckinghamshire, England in 1624. And they got the official records when the barn was put together. They got the records that they uh, bought the uh, Mayflower. <laughs> and they used all the, all the beams and everything on the inside of this barn. If you take a look on the right, you can see all the, all the rafters, all the beams, everything there. That's all from the Mayflower, and it's all been uh, documented. And it's quite a tourist attraction. People go to London, of course, Mayflower descendants. They want to see the, uh, uh, <clears throat> actually, the, uh, the Mayflower, and that's, that's where it is. It's in this uh, barn in England. So we'll go to the next slide. Now, John Howland gravesite, we're going to do a little bit of a recap here. He's in um, Plymouth, Massachusetts, Burial Hill. And we'll go to the next slide. And uh, Elizabeth Howland, now in, on the left, there's a st statue called the Pilgrim Maiden. And it doesn't specifically say that it was Elizabeth Howland, but... Historians say, um, just by looking at that statue and looking at the uh, portrait on the right, that the only, she's probably, that's probably made out of uh, her statue commemoration for her, but we don't really know that specifically. And she's also buried in Riverside, Rhode Island. And I took a picture of that cemetery, the opening of the cemetery, Ancient Little Neck Cemetery, 
and that was uh, one of the oldest cemeteries in Rhode Island. And she was actually buried there, because you remember, she moved from her house in Plymouth. She moved over to Swansea, which now that part of Swansea is called the Riverside, Rhode Island. And that's where she lived with her daughter until she died. And that's her gravestone on the, uh, on the top there. And we'll go to the next slide. Now, a little bit of a summary. You can imagine John Elizabeth Howland's story. It's quite a story. It started in 1607. Uh, we, start, we started our uh, story here, and that's the date where Elizabeth was born over in England. And so they went to, uh, you can see Scrooby, England there. We'll start on the uh, top left. They uh, went to church there in uh, Scrooby, England, and that's the building that still stands. And, of course, they took the ship across the, the North Sea over to Holland, and they uh, settled in Amsterdam, and then they moved, not too long, about 10 months, and they moved down to Leiden, Holland. That's a picture there of uh, Leiden, Holland in the middle. Then on the right, of course, they, uh, <clears throat> they took a boat, a ship across back to England, and then took on the Mayflower, which is on the right, all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, and John and Elizabeth were together. And then on the bottom left, they finally got their own house, and they that's put together in uh, Kingston, Massachusetts. And that's a typical house there. Typically, it's about the right size and everything. So let's give you an idea, a representation of what it looked like. And that's, of course, the site where they're doing the archaeological dig every summer, finding all, all sorts of things. Then in the middle, she moved, uh, well, when the house was burnt down during King Philip's War, they moved into Plymouth, Massachusetts, which is in the lower uh, middle group there, that house there, Jabez Howland House. And that's the, they say it's the only house that actually the pilgrims actually lived and actually heard the voices of the pilgrims in that house. And that's uh, open, uh, it's right on the uh, main street there in Plymouth. And they're very good, and it's run by the uh, Howland Society. And you can take a complete tour. They ask, answer all your questions, whatever. There's uh, adequate parking there, and it's uh, it, a lot of people don't know that. Um, uh, but it's definitely worth the trip to, uh, to see that. And then, of course, when she got older, she moved in with her daughter in Riverside, Rhode Island. And back then, of course, that was Swansea in a farmhouse, and that's a typical farmhouse in the picture on the lower right. And that's probably what it, what it looked like. The, uh, the actual site of that in Riverside, Rhode Island is kind of interesting. They say it's on uh, Woollett Avenue, and it's a, a, an apartment complex now was on that original site. And that's really an important part of history also. And that's quite, they both lived until their 80s. And, and the story that they, I mean, it's just hard, hard to believe everything they had, had to endure. You know, all the hardships in Holland and there all the persecutions in uh, England. And then the, uh, the terrible voyage across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then to finally come here in that terrible winter in Plymouth. And then have your house burnt down and... Uh, Years later, uh, it, it's, it's just an amazing uh, piece of history. So we'll go to the next slide. And that's your gravesite. And uh, it's on that uh, few side streets you have to travel on to find it. But there it is. And it's stoned uh, for Elizabeth Howland. And that's where uh, she's buried. Um, a lot of people really don't know that. A lot of this, this whole story is, is basically lost to history because a lot of historians really really, really don't cover that. They cover, um, uh, you know, the main pilgrims, and they really don't get into any depth with specifically for the, the Howland story. And if you go there now, uh, it, it's worth a trip. 
in a nice sunny day, go there and take a look at it. And now you can remember the, the story that I put together in four parts of John and Elizabeth Holland. And you can stand right there and uh, maybe think about what that, that poor woman had to uh, endure. They raised uh, 10 children and She's the only one, I believe, the only pilgrim that actually survived uh, and lived through the uh, King Philip's War. So now I have a couple of books here that I always like to show in case you want to go further, further reading or whatever. And this one right here is terrific. This one here is a book I really like a lot. King Philip's War, written by Eric Schultz and Michael Togas. And this has everything in it. <laughs> <laughs> the first half of the book, it, they, they describe the whole thing about uh, King Philip's War, which is excellent. And the second half of the book, Michael Togas, he travels all over New England and describes how to get to all the King Philip's War sites. And that's what I did. I've, I, I went, uh, my wife and I, we went to all over New England and uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Western Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island. <laughs> and they're all, it all tells you how to get there. And that's, that's an excellent book to have. You can pick it up and tells you how to get to all these sites. And of course, this other book right here we talked about, that's the complete manuscript of Plymouth Plantation, the record of it. And that's the story we had. We had the Mayflower uh, copy of it in the, in, the, uh, in the book and how it finally made it back to the Boston Library. And uh, this other one here I've got on my desk, I'll just, Nathaniel Philbrook, The Mayflower, excellent, excellent book, describes everything that we've talked about here. And then we also have, I always keep <laughs> showing this movie. I mean, I, I can't recommend this enough. Um, a lot of people think that, well, it's, you know, it probably can't be that good made in 1952. But it's very good. It's a very, very good one to see and to pick up. So once again, I hope you enjoyed this uh, story. A great piece of history piece of New England history, and right in our own backyard in Riverside, Rhode Island, is uh, where Elizabeth Howland ended her, uh, her story. So once again, it's Dave Norton from Discovering New England History. Have a good evening. Mm -hmm.